Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, nice to be live this morning. I'm Emily Richards. I'm founder and director of the Stickman Consultancy. And this morning, I have the honour of being joined, joined by John Gwynne Jones, uh, CEO of Fabicia. Hello, John. How are you? Very well. It's uh, sort of late afternoon, early evening here, 5 p.m. And not as cold as you are there in the UK as well. <laughs> yes, we have. You heard we've had snow down south this this uh, this morning overnight. Right. Well, I'm coming back in just over a couple of weeks, so I hope it'll warm up by then. <laughs> oh, lovely! And are you going back to your your cherished Wales when you hit when you head back? I hopefully will make a, a bit of a detour there. I'm going back on work. I'm attending Bet and also catching up with a number of our affiliates and so on. So it's a mixture of work and pleasure. Lovely. Okay. Well, if you come near Manchester, do let us know. Um, right. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. We thought, um, you know, we wanted to, you, you've just got so much experience. We really, really wanted to just pick your brains about where schools are at right now, what's going on in terms of their marketing, but wider as well. Um, wanted to hear a little bit more about Fabicia. And uh, well, I think a good place to start would be sort of if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what attracted you to the sector. Um, brief career history, if you will. OK, OK. Well, as you said, experience. Can you believe I, I started teaching in 1976? Oh, my goodness. <gasps> That's and, the year I was born. Uh, and then in nine, well, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I've just given away, away my age on LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then my, my first job overseas was in 1986. So I, I spent 10 years working in two schools in the UK. And then my first job overseas was in Hong Kong, working with a British military school. I was very fortunate because... At the time, my local authority in Wales uh, seconded me for three years to go and experience that environment. But, of course, I never went back. Um, wow. And then, of course, here I am now, um, 32 years later, still working all the time in, in Asia, Southeast wow. Asia. Uh, so my experience is within this region. Yeah. And I must say, you know, I, I would recommend this kind of career path to any young teacher because it's it, it's a great opportunity to experience international education uh, cultures of different schools travel um, and opportunities you know to to develop and grow um you know i've worked in several countries in asia um as i mentioned hong kong initially then Worked a long time in Malaysia before then supporting a school in Laos. And not many people have learned of La uh, heard of Laos. Mm. Um, and that was an amazing experience. Mm. And then now oh, I'm in the role of CEO of Fabicia. Fabicia, of course, the Federation of British International Schools in Asia, where we currently have 93 member schools. So it's across 18 different countries in Asia. Mm. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to connect with all these schools. And as a young head, Fabicia supported me so much and, um, mm. and still continues to offer that support to our network. So mm -hmm. that's a, a bit of it in a nutshell for you. Fantastic. Thank you, John. And uh, 32, was it 32 years over there, 30 years over there, and you still have a you know, that lovely, strong Welsh accent. Yeah, well, you know what they say, you can take the boy out of Wales, but you can't take <laughs> Wales out of the boy, isn't it? It's true. <laughs> and what would you say are the biggest marketing and admissions challenges facing your member schools right now? And what emerging challenges do you see? Or do you foresee? Well, you know, it's interesting. Recently, the ISC research uh, produced a white paper on the growth of international education globally. Uh, and what I found interesting in that is that the greatest growth of schools is here in Asia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
they've got 65, 60, and again, for marketing, not only is there a growth in schools, which is a challenge because then it's more competition, mm. but there's also a growth in student enrollment. So over the mm. last 10 years in Asia, there's been a growth of about 64% in student enrollment. Now, mm. the downside of that from a marketing perspective is there's been about 57% of growth in schools. Mm. Um, so, you know, I recall in Penang, you know, back in 2014 when I retired, um, there were more or less only two schools on the island of Penang that was attracting expatriates and local students. You know, now there are 10, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not a huge market. So if you're in an environment like that, there are challenges because everybody's mm -hmm. fighting for the same group of students. Um, so the growth of schools certainly has made marketing departments having to work harder mm. in being creative mm. in attracting families to come and select their school as a school of choice. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you've got countries like China where there are different challenges, you know, um, it's very unpredictable as to, for example, what the government might do in terms of your licensing, in terms of curriculum. Mm. Uh, so, you know, during COVID, for example, huge challenges in terms of the approach that country took towards COVID. So, you know, I, I really feel for those schools and the marketing departments because very little you can do. Mm. You know, now we're coming out of COVID, um, there seems to be a renewed energy in our environment, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the great thing for all marketing departments is that parents are seeing education as their priority for their children, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they want the best for their children in terms of the foundation, in, in terms of their education. And there's a growing middle class because the demographics have changed. You know, when I started in international schools, most of your families were expatriates. Mm. When in other countries now, uh, most of your parents are local parents in Thailand. Mm. In, yeah. um, and there's a growing middle class there. So, you know, that's, that's positive for your marketing departments. Mm. Um, but, you know, the greatest challenge is that of growth of schools. You know, you've got a suddenly a new school setting up down the road, you know, and, and yeah. depending on the school, you know, give you an example now. In Thailand, I just heard recently that two very renowned branded schools from the UK are coming into Thailand. Now you think, wow, the market's already saturated, right? Um, and is there room for these? And so the other schools think, oh, my goodness, you know, when we thought we were doing okay, then there's more school setting up. Mm. Um, but again, you know, it seems that the, there's enough to go around at the moment. And mm. um, But, you know, positioning yourself then in terms of, right, what makes us stand out from the crowd? Mm. You know, and, and that's a tough call because well, the reason I say it's a tough call because I look here in Bangkok, for example, and most of our international schools here are quite outstanding. You know, you yeah. go visit them. They've got incredible facilities, mm. uh, great teachers, wonderful resources, great teaching and learning environments. And it's not just one that stands out of the crowd. They all are, you know. So when you visit them, it's, oh, dear. Um <laughs> You know, it's interesting from a personal point of view. I have a grandson now who's in Singapore. Um, and there's a choice of schools there. And when my daughter-in-law went to visit one school, she was sold by it and said, right, I don't need to see anymore. And I said, no, you do. You know, you go and visit another school at least. Mm. So at least benchmark, you know, because that's the danger. They mm. go to one school and they'll be blown away with it. And they stay with that. Whereas um, 
And I, you know, I, they went to see another school and they came away and said, oh, gosh, we don't know what to do now, right? Um, <laughs> Too much choice. Yes, and, and good choices, as I said. Choices, yeah. Um, so then, you know, uh, that's good for parents. Um, and it's good for marketing departments as well, you know, because when a parent eventually selects your school, you know, you can celebrate that and say, and then, you know, marketing departments should be then surveying their parents and saying, well, why did you pick our school? Mm, and that yes. will give them a strong indication then of what their strengths are and what yes. their selling points should be, you know? Yes, absolutely. Oh, we have um, the lovely Susanna Dennis on here. She, I know she was keen to hear you speak this morning, John. And she says, having worked in Hong Kong in two big international schools, I know that the schools coming in are for profit. How okay. do you think this? How do you think this impacts those not for profits? And how can they survive given they will probably not have such shiny facilities? Ah, great question, Susanna. And um, yeah, you know, when I first came to Asia and when I first joined Fabicia, all our schools were not for profit. There mm. wasn't a one proprietor or for profit school. Mind you, when you say not for profit, schools do generate a surplus, otherwise they wouldn't survive. And But of course, the advantage of not for profit is they reinvest those surpluses into the school, right? Mm -hmm. And that should be a selling point from a marketing perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, not-for-profit schools should be blowing that trumpet. You yes. know, Because, uh, you know, one of the often comments that parents make about for-profit schools, even teachers in their schools are saying, well, you know, um, the owners or the company or the branded school are making a lot of money out of us. You know, why are the schools mm -hmm. so... So, so high when really. So, when an, you know, I I don't see that the pro for profit schools are denting the market for the not for profit schools. Mm. Um, good examples of that right around the region. You know, the not for profit schools um, usually have a, a longer reputation because initially the schools that set up were all not-for-profit. So they've been mm. around much longer. Mm. Um, so they do they do have then a good reputation. Uh, the parents have the confidence of knowing all the fun, all the fees they're paying goes towards hiring good teachers, goes into better resources. Of course, you are restricted, Susanna. You're absolutely right. You know, I remember visiting a school here in, in Bangkok. And I worked for a school in Malaysia where you were restricted as to what facilities you had. You know, the school was established, you know, mm. 20, 30 years ago, right? Um, or actually 50 years ago. Um, so, you know, there's not much you could do with the facility. And then a new school comes down the road with all these spanking new um, theatres and swimming pools and everything else. And I remember sharing with a school in Bangkok saying, well, you know, they were so proud of their school here in Bangkok. You know, they had a 50-meter swimming pool, 25-meter swimming pool, chest out, you know, oh, you know, what a wonderful school <laughs> our children are going to. I'm talking to the parents now. And I said to them, I said, you know, if you transferred to Malaysia, to Penang, and you had a primary age child, and you did your research, I'm quite convinced that you'd end up with your children child in the school that I last worked in and you would enter that school and you'd say where's the auditorium where's mm. the swimming pool <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> we them, right? but of course you know the environment these schools have created and I, I've got such expertise in and that's one huge selling point in terms of marketing yeah. is the ethos that the school creates yes. you know when yeah. you walk in bang right it's not so much the swimming pool or the theatre. It's mm. when you walk into that classroom, it's the welcome that you get. You know, that that's the huge selling point, right? Are you yeah. met by head yes. or is it an administrator that shows you around? Yeah. Um, do you go into the classrooms or they just point things out from a distance? Um, mm. So those are strategies I feel that from a marketing perspective, are so important. You know, when I 
was ahead, I would meet all new parents. I would mm -hmm. take them around. I would go into a classroom totally unannounced. Mm -hmm. I would engage with the teacher and the students. And, you know, the parents would walk away and thinking, oh, wow, you know. They'd feel mm -hmm. quite special. Yes. So strategies like that work. But as I said, you know, uh, there's not much you can do with not-for-profit schools that are long established with regards to resources mm. and facility. Well, it's resources, yes, but facilities, no. Mm. But yet, you've got to celebrate your strength, which is, uh, you know, you've been around a long time, you've developed a good reputation. And as yes. long as you maintain or enhance that, I don't think you've got anything to worry about then. Yes, yes. Does that answer your question, Susanna? I hope so. Um, thank you, John. Um, really interesting. And uh, I, I just wondered if you are seeing any trends about, uh, oh, Susanna's just come back, actually. Couldn't agree more, she says. Thank you. I miss working in an international school al already, so it's good to connect. I think Susanna... Well, come back, Susanna, come back. There's plenty of jobs here. Just drop me a line. <laughs> You've got an open door there, Susanna. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more, John, about the whole customer experience and those touch points and the head being involved and the right people being involved at the right points. And it's often we, we, we ran a masterclass yesterday on, on this. Uh, a large part of it was on this. And it's just those simple little surprise and delight moments that cost nothing to do but it just makes the difference between you and, you know, school down the road. And it is just, you know, those little touches, like you say, meeting the head, going into those classrooms, uh, the head talking directly to the prospective pupil, et cetera. You know, it's just, it all counts and builds in the prospective family's minds, doesn't it? Mind you, you know, with, with some of the larger schools, um, you know, they have marketing people. Some of them are some are ex-teachers, right? And and they are excellent mm. in selling the school to the parents. You know, they are very... Because what parents look for is that passion, you know? Um, yes. In terms of how proud whoever's presenting the school they are, to them are of their school. And, mm. you know, marketing departments are really... Or should be really good at that, right? Mm. Cost nothing beats, and of course, when you get to meet the head, in, in for some parents, that's a big deal, right? Mm. Um, and again, it depends. You know, you, you take some of these schools; they have waiting lists, so the head then, you know, is too busy doing other things and having to meet parents when he knows there's no room for them, right? Yes, so yeah, it's a fine balance sometimes as well. But I always mm. used to love to show parents. I could write a book about it, actually. <laughs> you should <laughs> and what do you think are the key drivers for parents when choosing an international school well as I said I think reputation is important so again coming back to Susanna's question you know the, the challenge with a new school they don't have any histo historic data you know in terms of things like exam results and so on mm. yeah. um, so Parents are a little bit um, receptive in terms of new schools. So then what do you do to overcome that mm -hmm. um, in terms of, okay, uh, so, some schools have that reputation because of the brand. You know, they are um, an from an independent school in UK. Mm -hmm. So the schools sell that brand to them as to their own location. Um, so reputation is quite important and, and parents tend to ask for that, you know, right, which school do you recommend? Right, uh, yeah. Do their research. Because um, costs are a factor sometimes, and that's becoming more and more the case. Mm. So that's why you see the growth of the sort of middle-range fee schools or even the lower-range schools. You know, uh, I was in Singapore recently, and, you know, there's a new brand set up there, Um catering for those parents who can't afford the established schools in Singapore. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are pitching their fees lower. They're guaranteeing them quality teaching and learning, right. but may not have all the bells and whistles, right? Yes, okay. Um, but the fee structure then 
is quite attractive and for a many mm-hmm. family that's important so there's been a growth of lower fee uh, type schools mm-hmm. also, you know, the, uh, there's lots of factors that parents will ask you know like what are your exam like exam results like you know historically um, which universities do your students transfer to again celebrate that you know I walked into a school recently and there's a huge chart showing which universities their students are going to you know and you've got your Oxford and your Cambridge and your Harvard there you know so when you see that thing oh wow and then I went to another school and recently they'd been celebrating the Cambridge Awards for the exams here best in country best in the world and then they had these wonderful photos of their students and underneath best in Thailand for biology, best in the world for mathematics. Now, as a new parent, I look at those and think, oh, wow, you know, this yeah. school is putting some outstanding results, right? So, <laughs> um, again, great marketing in terms of just a simple visual. Yes, a bold right mm. In promoting it, you know. Um, yeah. And then location often is important you know um are you in you know that's becoming more and more challenging you know when new schools are setting up now mm. the cost of putting a school in a a perfect location is a capital investment is huge yes, so then yeah. schools then have to possibly look at alternative locations that may not be ideal mm. so again that that could be a, a plus, it could be a negative. So how mm. do you overcome or how do you promote that? Mm. And so I mean facilities, you know, the, as we said earlier, parents are are taken by and you know, you <laughs> it's interesting, you know, we they take you know, people take me around schools and I go into these beautiful um, gymnasiums or theaters and most of the time they're empty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know they, they are very attractive, right? Yeah. Um, yes. They're empty because, you know, there are other priorities with the school. Yes, so, yes, yeah. They're also attractive. So yeah. I think a lot of factors like that, you know, and it's yeah. quite a mixed bunch. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. And I'd love to know... Um, Really, what your your kind of why is? Why do you do what you do? Why why have you done that for thirty years? And what keeps you motivated? What keeps you driving you forwards? Well, you know, the great thing about international education is it is always performance related. And as you say, the same with marketing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't do a good job, you're gone. Okay, and um, and you know the opposite of UK you could be a very average or even a poor teacher and you've got a job for life unless you do something really stupid right whereas in an international school environment it's the opposite you know mm. your career is based on your performance or your mm. security is based on how you how how hard you work and mm-hmm. and I have to say you know teachers in international schools are worth their weight in gold right um, school leaders more so um, because there's always challenges there's always that pressure to be better mm. um, and likewise with your marketing um, you know you've got to attract those students and you've got to promote your school as being the best right in whichever field and again you've got to look at right how do we promote our schools what's what's unique about our environment that's different to others. And schools are changing. Tack now, you know, okay, we're, we're a sporting school or we're a school that um, is inclusive in terms of special educational needs, perhaps, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or we have got a huge commitment to sustainability and the environment. So they're selling quite a unique uh, product as such. Yes. But, you know, I love this career. You know, it's, 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 it's full on all the time. Mm. Uh, it's very rewarding uh, in so much that, you know, you do a good job and that is recognized. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all about the students, right? And, you know, you're always wanting to produce the best 
so that they go home and tell their parents, I love my school and the parents and they are your best ambassadors. So, you, you know, you don't need your marketing then. Just let the parents be do do that for you, you know. Um, yeah. But it's been a great career, and uh, particularly here in Asia. You know, I love the culture. It mm. is quite I've been very fortunate to be in a region that has grown. You know, uh, if you look at the ISE research, you know, Asia has most definitely had the highest amount of growth. You know, 57% of new schools over the last 10 years, right? Mm. 64% increase in enrollment over the last 10 years. Mm. And so Asia has been the hot spot, and I'm so fortunate to have been here in that respect and, and mm. seen it. As I said, I, like Susanna is asking, I've seen schools go from not-for-profit to the majority of schools now being branded or for-profit schools or um, investors coming mm. in and buying up schools. So it's been an interesting uh, development, you know, and continues to be so. Because, you mm -hmm. know, if you were to talk to people five years ago, China, China is the place, right? Everybody's getting into China. Mm. <laughs> now everybody's possibly coming out of China, right? Because <laughs> the environment has changed. Mm. And there's different challenges there now. And, of course, mm. there's... You know, with those challenges, investors and schools also adapt. So, you know, you now have a growth of bilingual schools in certain countries because those mm. become more effective. Mm. So that's very smart then to see, right, where is the market shifting, right? Mm -hmm. And where do we need to shift with it to capture that market? So it's been an amazing journey. And as I said, I'm fortunate to be in part of the world where, it's been so exciting. Oh, how lovely. And I think I suspect they're very lucky to have you as well, John. So um, yeah, it's been an absolute joy to hear. Hear your thoughts, hear your, you know, uh, ideas around the marketing and what you believe is important and the the change in the market as well. Um and yeah, yeah you know, one, years. one of the things we emphasize as a federation is you know, you've got competition, but you must always be professional throughout it, you know, and mm -hmm. um, we have a code of conduct and we do tell particularly our mar marketing people, you know, don't overstep the mark, right? And of course, they're under pressure from their owners, right? Bums on seats, right? Return of investment. And don't worry about uh, whether you go and with our football team to another school and give our leaflets out to their parents. You know, no, you can't do that, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, the code of conduct and being professional is very, very important. And, you know, we do a lot of professional development with, with the support of people like yourselves uh, for our marketing people, right? Like, as mm -hmm. you know, we've got mm -hmm. a lot of our schools that are working with you at the moment, right? Which yes. is wonderful. Yes. Um, so the code of conduct, being professional, uh, is is also very very important. Yes, absolutely. And I have to say, it's um, as far as we're concerned, it's it's a real joy to work with Fabicia, partner with you, and to work with your member schools. They are absolutely lovely. And uh, as you say, you know, competition is fierce. They're aware of that and, uh, you know, we're hopefully, you know, pointing them in the right direction in terms of what to do about that. So it's a real joy. And uh, thank you so much for your time this morning. If anyone listening would like to get in touch with you, John, what's the best way uh, they can contact you? Well, if you look at the Fabicia website, um, you know, you can contact us through there. Um, there we are. And... Um, and have a look at our schools, have a look at our environment. You know, as I said, we are now close to 100 schools, really. Um, yes, so, you know, and we as a federation are not for profit. You know, we do this in total support of our schools. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the leadership or the teachers or the teaching assistants, but it is about the marketing people and the human resources uh, and the operational managers and the um, the financial controller. So we, 
we support all aspects of schools then, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're doing wonderful things. And you've got your big conference next week. Yes. So, oh, don't I mind me. Don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, not we've, got a, we've got a lot to look forward. We've got about 300 odd people coming. Or three, wow. 350, I think. So it's it's our biggest ever conference, of course. Wow, amazing. And, oh. um, I've got a wonderful wow. team here at Fabicia HQ in Bangkok. They are yeah. absolutely outstanding so I'm very fortunate oh. in their capable hands really oh we'll give a shout out to dawn hello dawn um and thank you for all your support dawn to us we're very grateful and thank you to you john as well um really really lovely to talk to you and uh, i can't see who's on with us but i'm sure i know people were really keen to hear your thoughts this morning so um and hi susanna if you're still with us and thank you for your question um thank you so much have a great well it's five o'clock with you it's now half five with you so i'll let you go and enjoy your evening john and <laughs> Um, <laughs> Can I just say one thing? You know, I, these days you you have to be careful what you say. You know, and if I have said anything that's upset anyone or offended anyone, I apologize because <laughs> uh, the world has changed. You know, I was reading about how how they're changing now the vocabulary in Roald Dahl's books. You know, and oh, uh, yes, that's and, awesome. dear. and so if I've said anything wrong. I uh, please forgive me. <laughs> oh, not at all. I think everything you've said is completely right. And uh, we've got Damien Challenger on with us as well from Nexus. Hi, Damien. He says thanks very much. So, um, yes, lovely. lovely wishing, you a, wishing you a lovely good evening and uh, we will see you soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. Bye. Lovely to see you again. Bye bye, and everyone. Bye bye.